my boy? You look beat. What's getting you down? Uh, this new carburetor, Tech. I've been trying to smooth out the idle for almost 20 minutes. And boy, I'm just nowhere. It's got you over all four barrels, eh? Well, cheer up, Nate. Here comes Mark to the rescue. And we'll both help the bear you out. <laughs> I saw somebody running up the white flag. Having any trouble, Nate? No more than trying to dial a phone with boxing gloves, Mark. This carburetor's not so simple. Oh, it only seems that way to strangers, Nate. Actually, once you get to know it, you'll find it to be one of the easiest four-barrel jobs to service. Suppose we get you acquainted and help you find out what's wrong. I'll buy that. Nate, did you check compression and ignition first, and then run the car out on the road? Yeah, Mark. Uh, compression, plugs, points, and timing were okay. Engine idle is still rough, however, and there's a stumble on acceleration. But just off and on, like the customer said. While the engine was warm, I set idle speed at 500 RPM. Then I tried turning in both idle mixture screws the same amount, a little at a time. I hope you didn't turn those needles more than one-eighth of a turn at a time. It doesn't take much of a change to hit it right. Well, I'm not sure, Tech, but I must have tried everything. I turned them in almost all the way and made the mixture lean. I turned them out almost all the way and made the mixture rich. Then I tried to hit a mixture in between. And what happened? Well, I got some improvement when I adjusted one idle mixture screw. But the other screw, no change at all. One bank of cylinders seems to be fairly good, the other rough. Well, maybe that one needle's damaged. Oh, I checked that, Tech. No ridge on the idle needle, not even a mark. And you can see that the choke is working okay. Did you try taking the air horn off? Nope. I'm not sure how this uh, carburetor's made inside. Then we'll start there, Nate. So disconnect the choke and throttle linkages, then take off the carburetor. These legs protect the throttle valves and make disassembly easier. Usually, you won't have to take the carburetor off the car. But in this case, we can tell you more about it on the bench. I understand. Okay, now, we might find that the float level is too high or too low. Or there might be dirt, say a, a plugged idle jet. Also, air leaks might be upsetting the fuel-air ratio. We'll check floats first which means the air horn must come off. So disconnect the fast idle and accelerator pump rods. Hold the cover plate down, Nate, as you remove its screw. Then the step-up piston, rod, and spring won't fly out. Do that on both sides. You could remove the air horn without taking out the step-up pistons, but installing the air horn is easier with them removed, so you might as well take them out now. I see. Ten screws hold down the air horn. Eight small ones, one medium, one long. And don't miss the medium screw in this counterbore. And lift the air horn straight up, Nate, to avoid damage to the floats. Only two main castings, huh? Not bad. Yep, it's a neat design job, Nate. Now, you'll be using a new gasket when you reinstall the air horn, and the floats have to come out to install that gasket. Next. Mark the float that's on the same side as the pump. That's because you want to keep each float, its needle valve, and seat assembly together. They must go back on the same side from which they were removed. Now, let's check for dirt in the float bowls. That's why we didn't drain the gas. You can sometimes see and even feel foreign matter. It's the number one enemy of the carburetor. Hey, I think I do feel something gritty, Mark. Mm, could be normal dirt, Nate. This car has seen a lot of miles. Let's remove the fuel inlet screen and see how clean that looks. Check the needle valves and seats, too, for possible deposits. The inlet screen is partly plugged, but the needles and seats are clean. Let's keep that dirt possibility in mind while we make another check. Inspect the mating surfaces of both castings for nicks and burrs which can cause air leaks. Dress down any rough spots you find. No roughness here. Mating surfaces look okay. Good. Install a new gasket, then, and reassemble the floats and needles. Float level on this carburetor has to be measured with the gasket in place. Gasket's got to be there. That's something new. Right. Now, to check float ahead of the float shell first, to see if the float is parallel to the edge of the horn casting. The float looks parallel to me. Okay. If they weren't, 
You'd adjust them by using your thumb to support the float lever and using your forefinger to apply pressure near the end of the float. But since our floats are lined up, make sure there's no excessive clearance between the float lever tabs and air horn lugs. You'd remove clearance by bending the float lever tabs. These floats work freely without any excess side play. That's swell. Now, Nate, with the gasket in place, the air horn inverted, and needle valve seated, use this gauge to check float level. Measure from the gasket to the float's outer end. Mm-hmm. That seems to be okay. Whenever float level isn't right, bend the float arm close to the float shell and recheck float level and alignment. Is that all on floats? Nope. There's still float drop. You check it by measuring from the outer end of the float to the gasket. Hmm. Float drop on this carb checks out all right. Whenever float drop isn't right, bend the stop tab at the rear of the float arm. Well, on this job, we know the floats were adjusted okay. All right, Nate. Now, loosen those primary Venturi screws and remove both Venturi assemblies. We'll check them for dirt. Say, the idle jet on this Venturi assembly looks plugged. It's on the same side where Nate couldn't get any improvement. Yeah, that dirty jet could well be our trouble, Tech. It makes sense to me. The plugged idle jet would affect both idle and low speed performance. Idle would be rough and there would be that occasional stumble. Hey, not so fast, fellas. Dirt in that jet is plain enough, but I still feel kind of lost. First, I didn't know it was part of the Venturi. Second, what a Venturi does was always a mystery to me. Now, I can clean the jet, but just how does that Venturi figure in? All good questions, Nate. And we ought to get down to earth a little more, like reviewing some carburetor fundamentals. I'll go along, Tech. A little brushing up always seems to help. Starting with the carburetor, you know its main job is to automatically and accurately meter air and gas. It does this in varying amounts to satisfy changing needs of the engine. And the engine, remember, is basically an air pump. Pistons moving down create lower air pressure inside the cylinders. Outside atmospheric pressure pushes air into the engine to equalize the pressure. All that air is pushed right down through the carburetor. It often rushes through there at speeds higher than 400 miles an hour. Golly, that fast, huh? Yeah, Nate, a fellow named Venturi found that we could step up air speed in a certain area by narrowing the tube, sort of pinching it together. And right at that pinched in area, Venturi found there was a pressure drop when compared with atmospheric pressure. He also found that as air velocity increased, the pressure drop became greater. Now, with the high speed nozzle in the Venturi low pressure area, atmospheric pressure pushes on fuel in the bowl, forcing it out of the nozzle where it mixes with air. Uh, speaking of mixing, Somebody please turn this record over. It's time to change sides. How the Venturi works isn't so complicated after all. Right. And by making the Venturi assemblies on this aluminum four-bore job removable, the designers sure simplified service. Uh, they sure did, Tech. The removable Venturi has the air bleed, high-speed nozzle, main vent tube, and idle jet built in. All are carefully calibrated to mix air and fuel in the right proportion for good performance. Uh-huh. I can see why dirt can be our big bugaboo. It upsets the calibration. That's the idea, Nate. Now, even though we're reasonably sure we found the trouble, let's cover the rest of the carburetor to check on other possibilities. Uh, let's start our checking in the low speed system, Mark. Unless Nate needs no help on that. Well, maybe we ought to run through that. On this new carburetor, I'm not sure of anything. On any carburetor, Nate, a rich mixture is needed when the throttle's closed for idling or partly closed during low-speed operation. Pressure drop isn't great enough to produce flow at the main nozzle. That's why there is a low-speed system. And on this carburetor, it's located on the primary side. Low-speed jets are pressed into the primary Venturi assemblies. Bypass air passages, an economizer, and air bleed built into the Venturi assembly, break up liquid and mix in air before it gets to the idle and low speed ports. 
The low speed port is slotted, Nate. As the throttle valve opens, it uncovers more of the port and increases the flow of air-fuel mixture. I get it. Will the low speed system need any special service? <laughs> well, Nate, the idle jets and passages and bleeds have to be clean. And of course, worn idle adjustment screws should be replaced. Uh, denatured alcohol is a good solvent for cleaning. Never use a wire or drill to clean jets or air bleeds. Don't worry. I know that can chew out those holes and make them too big. That's right. And remember, new Venturi gaskets are necessary to prevent any air leaks. But now, let's look at the high-speed system. The high-speed system supplies fuel for part and full throttle operation. The two front barrels contain the primary high-speed system. The two rear barrels contain the secondary high-speed system. In the primary system, manifold vacuum operating on the vacuum piston regulates step-up rod position. The step-up rod in the main metering jet controls how much fuel goes to the nozzles. Uh, during part throttle operation, manifold vacuum is high. It pulls the step-up piston and rod down against a spring and puts the large diameter of the rod in the jet. The reduced flow results. Then during wide open throttle, vacuum is lower, so the spring takes over. Up goes the rod, putting its smaller diameter in the jet. More fuel can flow through the jet. This rod, by the way, doesn't require adjustment. The high-speed nozzle, air bleed tube, and main vent tube of this system are part of the primary venturi and are not serviced separately. That's this bleed tube here, huh? That's right, Nate. That high-speed bleed also serves as an anti-percolator vent. When a hot engine stops or idles, vapor pressure in the idle well escapes through the tube. This keeps vapor pressure from pushing fuel out of the nozzle. A clogged air bleed or main vent tube will cause too rich a mixture. So clean them thoroughly along with the main metering jet and all passages. Then blow everything dry with compressed air. Remove the step-up rods, pistons, springs, and jets for cleaning and inspection when necessary, as in a major reconditioning. Handle that spring with special care, Nate. It's calibrated to work that step-up rod just right. If it's stretched, or damaged, it's no good at all and will have to be replaced. I'll watch that tech. Okay. Now, in the secondary high-speed system, fuel is metered at the secondary metering jets in the float bowl. No step-up rods are used. I see that the air bleed, high-speed nozzle, and vent tube are part of the secondary venturi assembly. Yep, and as in the primary system, a clogged air bleed or vent tube can cause too rich a mixture. I got it, Mark. Now, how about the linkage between primary and secondary throttle? Well, the secondary throttle valves are linked mechanically to the primary throttle valves by a rod. The secondaries stay closed until the primaries are about two-thirds open. Both valves reach wide open position at the same time. Now, to check the secondary throttle valve operation, block the choke valve wide open. Secondary throttle valves should just start to open when the primary throttle valves are open three-eighths of an inch, measured between the edge of the valve and bore. Now, to adjust throttle valve opening, bend the throttle operating rod. Okay, Mark. Anything else on this adjustment? Yeah. With the primary and secondary throttle valves tightly closed, there should be 10 to 30 thousandths between the positive closing shoes on the primary and secondary throttle levers. Bend the secondary shoe if you don't get this clearance. All right, I understand. Fine, Nate. Now, a secondary throttle valve lockout controlled by the choke rod locks the secondary valves closed until the engine warms up and the choke is fully open. Crack the throttle valves. Manually open and close the choke valve. Now, the tang on the secondary throttle lever should freely engage in the notch of the lockout dog. If adjustments needed, bend the tang on the secondary throttle lever. I see. Now, is the secondary high-speed system serviced like the primary one? Yep. Thorough cleaning plus new gaskets just about covers it. Tech's right. Now, this carburetor naturally has an accelerator pump system. 
and it works very much like those you know about. If any service is necessary, leather in good condition, cleaning of discharge nozzles, and checking for leakage at intake and discharge check valves are the major points to keep in mind. But since we found dirt, Nate... I know, Tech, I know. Clean the intake and discharge check valves. And I'd do it if I could find them. Just what I was about to tell you. Now hold still a minute. Remove this brass plug from the bottom, and out comes the intake check valve and seat. The discharge check valve is under the pump discharge nozzles, which are also removable. Clean them up and use a new gasket under the nozzles. All right. How about pump stroke? Well, Nate, regardless of season, put the connector in the center hole. There should be seven sixteenths of an inch between the top of the bowl cover to the top of the plunger. Bend the connector rod at its lower angle if needed. Okay, Mark. What's next? The choke system, Nate. It's provided on only the primary side since the secondary barrels are locked out when the engine's cold. A crossover type choke is used on this model. An integral type choke is used on other models. So only the method of adjusting the choke differs on all AFB carburetors. I'll keep it in mind. Good. Now, the fast idle throttle valve adjustment is one we can check easier on the bench. Hold the choke fully closed. Tighten the fast idle adjusting screw on the index mark until you get 12 thousandths between the throttle valve and bore. You got that? Yep. Now what? Well, Nate, dirt is really all we've found. So let's change the fuel filter element. Then let's get this carburetor back on the engine and see how she runs. Hey, this engine's really smooth now. Cleaning up the carburetor sure made a difference. Yeah, Nate. And now that you understand construction and operation, you're gonna like this new carburetor. But I still need dope on that integral choke model you mentioned. And on cars using two four-bower carburetors. Details on that are in this reference book. In addition, there's a complete story on adjustments. Swell, Tech. I'll give this book a thorough going over. Do that, my boy. Now you and all of our technicians ought to roll up your sleeves and try your hand on these new carburetors. A little practice now will prevent some fumbling in the future. <laughs> <laughs>